that's that that's a very personal question that goes back to just thinking on the journey. Um and I think one of the greatest opportunities I've had um growing up was I grew up in Ibadan. And for my national youth service, I had the opportunity to go to um Ebony State. And up to that point, I had never lived in a part of the country before. And for me, like going to the East was a whole new world. I mean, I had lived in the East just the previous year where I'd had my law school in Enugu, but I was in a campus. And then here we were going to be living in the main society, you know, engaging. And while in the Eastern part of the country in Ebony, I had the opportunity to live within the barracks. I was working with the, the police and this was the closest I got to living every day with my evil brothers and sisters. Um, but then something very profound I'll just reflect on was a particular um, um, woodcarver, his, uh, like a sculptor. He, 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 he makes all these um, arts work that have stories about the history of the Ibos. And I got very close to the family and everything that his work began to tell me was a whole different experience about, you know, the, the, the mentality, bringing you into the whole thinking of the Ibo man. And it became a high point for me when, I, when, he, was in, when he invited me over to his house to come and, to, to come and have um, a meal. And I was excited. I got into the house and the first thing that he did before I could even eat my meal was he, he, he collected the spoon from me and stirred it and took, a, and, and, and took some. And then he asked me to eat. Now, in my culture, that's like, why would you do that? <laughs> and then again, we went into a story. And, and I think one of the things that DK had talked about was you know, the power of storytelling. And most of the work I've done has really resonated around, you know, this cultural expressions and ways that indigenous peoples tell their story from generation to generation. And being able to live with such a person, you know, like in such a close proximity and hearing stories on a day-to-day -day basis was, always, was almost like an introduction into the mindset or the history, the journey of the Igbos. And this was expressed even through the, the art that he did every day, which... If I had seen that on a shelf somewhere, I would not attach anything to it. But now it means something different. And that experience transformed for me how I even view evil people. Because then I began to understand more what the war, the, you know, the whole history of the evil journey meant and how they were able to express that. So I think that, just in sum, that while music plays a role, you know, you have the, the festivals, the dances, but I also think that storytelling has been a very, very key part of our journey as people. And you see that the control of the narratives of people has been a powerful force in terms of uniting people and also dividing people. And so when we we're able to really use storytelling to our advantage, it helps us to understand where people are coming from and process how reconciliation works through that right lens, rightful lens. Thank you very much, Toby. Thank you very much. I think that gradually we are bringing it home. So, from what you have said, I could pick something. Empathy. Empathizing you from Ibadan. You went to a boy. You saw their culture. Wow, how do you take food and take from me before you give me the spoon? And finally, you understood what he was trying to do. So, you began to empathize. You began to understand, to appreciate, then to respect that side, without dropping your own culture or dropping your own opinion, but you embrace that. Is that what, uh, is that your notion? I don't want to assume, this is what you meant. Beautiful. So this is leading us to the next direction of empathy. Does empathy play a major role in fostering unity in diversity, especially in a complex nation like Nigeria? And I'm going to tell you a little story. I watched, um, a stage drama as a teenager, Ovoraren Ogbaisi. The story of how the British plundered um, the Benin Kingdom, um, 1897. You know, the courage of uh, Oba Ovoraren Ogbaisi, 
the the exploits of Olugbo uh, Shere, the, the, the general commanding the um, warriors of Benin. It was so magnificent. Then I became very curious. Who is this Olugbo Shere? Who is Obura? Even I couldn't even call the name very well. Obura. Anyway, I began to I began to research. Then I realized a lot was looted. A lot was taken, among which is the the mask Idia. They call it Queen Idia. There's this pop. They, we call it Festac head in Nigeria now. Is the Queen Idia now locked up in a in a show glass at the British National Museum? I mean, discussion for another day. Then I began to think, oh, okay. Then I joined the movement, repatriate art to their cradle. Then I began to say our art in Britain, Oriolo, uh, Idia, our Okuko. Then I said, okay, I'm from Mekiti. Now Queen Idia Ed is our, out of empathy, it became ours. So this is the role of changing the narrative. Art bringing the consciousness. Without that drama, I wouldn't have really known much about the massacre, um, the Benin massacre of 1897. If I had not known about Benin massacre of 1897, I wouldn't have empathized with the people of Benin. And I wouldn't have identified with that culture with the, the heritage, with the art pieces. And now I think it's ours. If, if, despite the fact I'm from equity. So let's take it down to the place of empathy. DK, one of your, your show made in Nigeria draws that thing in us whenever we watch. I don't know how many people have seen that show. If the, the empathy, you will empathize from people from different parts of Nigeria. Because that show touches everywhere. And I'm not the marketing manager of this show. Only I'm seeing a very, very tangible example of how art has been deployed to, to arouse um, consciousness, start pushing towards unity and diversity. DK, do you have another example, apart from Made in Nigeria, that you can see that where art has helped you understand a people better, a narrative better, a culture better, and you have empathized, then you began to re respect or began to move in towards their direction or embrace general in the Nigerian context. I was, I was thinking about it because I wanted to answer. I mean, there are other things that have helped me empathize with people from other parts. So I was trying to think specifically of art. And um, um, Abu Bakr Adam, you know, born on a Tuesday. Uh, El Nathan, El Nathan, born on a Tuesday, really helped me to. It took me into the northern, the northern experience, the life of an Al Najeri in the north. Something that I haven't. I was, I, I was born in Lagos. I grew up in Lagos, you know. So I'm very. I know Lagos is very far, you know. It really is. So it, that book really helped to open my eyes to what it felt like to be an Almajiri in the North. And it helped to humanize many things for me. Same with uh, um, um, Crimson Blossom, um, Abubakar, Season of, Season of Crimson Blossom by Abubakar Adam Ibrahim, a collection of short stories, was also predominantly in the north with northern characters and it was one of the first times i was encountering there's a lot of northern literature but it's often written in a language that i can't access one of my first times of encountering uh, stories about the north by northerners written in a language that i could assess and i found it really really helpful even as a creative who was also trying to understand that i could also write into that space so those two books really helped me Thank you very much. So, Abi Karim, can we hear your experience on this as well? How, what form of art? Visual art, music, dance, drama? Is there any form, do you have any story to tell in the direction of one art form helping you to understand a people better, a story better, a narrative better than to empathize? 
then you maybe you began to embrace. Well, yeah, I grew up in um in an an environment where art everywhere, paintings on wall, books, music, film, TV. You know, just name it. It was there, and you were encouraged to get into as much of it as your age at that time. You know, could carry. Now, for me, when you mentioned empathy, you, you lost me a bit because I feel empathy is the emotional equivalent of um, understanding. And I think understanding in its own clinical way is better. And all that art I was exposed to as a youngster, I think, helped shape an understanding of my environment. To be honest, I, I feel very strange when people are talking about otherness, always people. At Yoruba man over there, you know, in that sense, in that sense of um, presenting an otherness. Yeah. Because growing up, I mean, um, okay, I didn't, uh, part of the arts, I didn't mention food. I, I yeah, I was eating Ogono soup, you know, it found it. Yeah. yeah. I'm from a northern family, you know, a goosey soup, um, a way to everything, name it. There's something called Shoko Yokoto. As well. I know it. Yeah. <laughs> so your white people don't even know that. But yeah, I, I remember the distinct taste, you know. And yeah. so I think it might have been unconscious. Maybe I had a certain kind of, maybe my parents were a certain kind of way, but um, I don't think it was conscious. They were just people who understood their environments and they wanted probably maybe their kids to do the same. So, um, let me single one particular one out. Music. Music. On here, even some of the old um, Igbo high life music or high life music, you know, that Igbo people sang. Specifically, you had the stories within the songs, Yellow CC, Sudan for Corner. I mean, I was probably 11 and I was imagining <laughs> that kind of issue. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, I will still come back to paintings. Again, the works of Gani Odutokun. Tayokwe, through Tayokwe's works, you would, you know, figure out stuff like, you know, Yoruba chiefdoms and, you know, how their royal system works. I mean, I I, I was probably 10 when I read a book about um, Brazilian uh, practice of the Yoruba religion. A 10-year-old me reading about Orishas. Yeah. You know, so it, it art, you cannot, you cannot emphasize it enough. That um, exposing, you know, people to art is the best way to get them to understand other people and other cultures. And then, you know, how you said it in the most, um, and I mean this nicely, in the most cliched way, yeah. you know, that we all live peacefully understanding each other. Thank you very much. So, I am Yoruba. I'm from the Southwest. I'm from Ekiti State. But one of my... Best adage D. It means when a man says context, God in this context is not like the supreme God. Every man has a God. It's like your Yoruba context, they call it Ori, uh, your own God, apart from the supreme God. And every many of my works, Onyekwe Chi keeps popping up. I don't care where it comes from, it just resonates with me and it helps me. me along my path in life. Anything I want to do, and I feel, DG, you have to do this. I say, oh, yeah. Wait, you, wait. you have to get this done. I'm not sure that it's not mine. In quote, it's culture. I mind strength more effective. There's, there are lots of ingredients. DK, what other ingredients do you think we can infuse into art? And remember, we have visual art, we have musical art, literary. It, there's a lot of this. Even, I think, culinary art, the food thing. Uh -huh, now, <laughs> so chefs are artists now, in, you know, and I like that kind of art. So, what other, what ingredients? 
do you think we can inject into art for it to be more effective? Or what other direction do you think we can tilt art into to, to better achieve this goal of forcing unity, changing narratives for positive change in the society? I think the most important thing uh, for an artist or creatives that are interested in using their arts in this way, I think the most important thing we can do is to listen, to listen to people from the other side. We all come from, um, I do a lot of engagement around this thing, and I know that many of us are not aware of the biases we carry because they are so normal and natural to us. We grew up in a certain space and you just consider certain things to be the fundamental truth and other things to be alternatives or other ways of looking at it. But you have your own set way. And to get to the point where you, you understand that what you consider your set way is also an alternative to somebody. And to really listen to the other person without bias and um, I started doing Made in Nigeria, for instance, seven years ago. And for me, it's a social experiment. As an artist, to have been doing one, performing one work for seven years and taking it around the country. What happens is that the way I perform the work has evolved as I've gotten to understand even better what I'm talking about. So I have, there's a piece in the poem titled, I Did Not Kill the Sedona. And when I wrote that piece and... Um, I told an uncle or an uncle of mine that I'm going to perform a piece on stage titled I Did Not Kill the Sedown. He and this was a very serious, an older Igbo gentleman. He called me and he pleaded with me, please don't perform that piece. That it will cause trouble. He was so traumatized just by the title. And I said, Uncle, I promise you that I have done my research and the way I'm going to do it. It will not upset anybody. And I went ahead and I did it. And it didn't cause any eruptions. And you know, I continued to do it. But after a while, and 95% of people who see the show love it. You know. I was walking down the street one day and I encountered a random northern lady. I didn't know who she was. And she said, I've seen your show. I love your show. It's wonderful. And then she walked away. She looked a bit hesitant. And she came back and said, I don't know if I can, if I'm allowed to say something. I said, yeah, feel free. And she said, I think you tell it too much from the Igbo side. Like you don't really, you know, that we also have a way we see those, you know. And as an artist, it was for me to say, okay, and listen to what this person is trying to say and understand that the way it is viewed in Enugu is different from the way it's viewed in Kano, in Meiduguri. But can I find a sweet spot that anybody seeing it will feel that my perspective, even though, even if my conclusion is mine, but that I took your point of view into consideration before arriving at that conclusion. I find that whenever people feel that they have been seen and that their point of view has been taken into consideration, they are better able to ask whatever the verdict is, but that you honestly, objectively, with an open heart, considered my view before reaching it. So for me as a creative, that has been the most powerful tool just to listen to people without my biases. And it's, it was a very difficult journey for me, but the more I've done it, the more effective I've become in the practice of my own art. Thank you very much. That was a quite profound insight. So, which is leading on into a, another direction now. Evolution of art. Time evolves. Art should evolve with time. We can borrow from the past to tell the story of the present, leave something for the future, then maybe bring something from the future if it's possible. So that means our art in Nigeria Maybe there's something that needs to be done. Maybe there's a, there's a perspective we, we need to direct it to, to suit the purpose of using it to achieve 
um, unity in diversity on a very, very large scale. I know people are trying their best, songs from here and there, um, paintings, um, theatrical performances, trying to foster unity in diversity. As an intellectual property expert, so, <laughs> so, so I'll come to you here. What, what do you want to see? What, what dimension or direction do you want to see our art tilt towards that maybe you think if it's in this direction and if you're comfortable with what we have, fine, that if it's in this direction, it can better serve the purpose of achieving, of helping to promote unity and diversity in Nigeria. Thank you, Deji. That's a, a very big question, honestly. I, know. I set you up. <laughs> but I think um, while the conversation's been going on, I think one of the memories, I'll just yeah. go back first, is, you know, there was a time Nigeria hosted under 17 World Cup. I think it was 95. 95 or 99? 95, I believe. And it was Nigeria, 95. But what was significant was the theme song that came out for that competition. And it's people who might have followed football at the time. It was a song that went like, um, welcome to Nigeria, 99, 99, right? 99. So, um, and it had, I mean, me as a young boy at the time, it had the first time I would really see different cultures all together. In, and I just thought to say that um, the government or we also have an opportunity to take advantage of key moments in our history to infuse our art as a tool of social engineering. So just that song, the picture of tribes coming together to sing a song that was not, um, it, was, it was sung in all languages. So we also got the chance to be singing different languages, even though I didn't understand what was being said, but we all knew the songs. And I think that um, we do have, it could be, um, inaugurations, it could be uh, it could be national events, but just capturing on these key moments to also continue to promote this message, I think is very important. But then when you ask me, where do I see or what do I want to see art grow? Yeah. I think as in the field I work, intellectual property, there are two things that really strike me. The first is that is, is what creatives themselves consider an opportunity. You know, when you, when you take the path of I seek to use my creativity to champion a course. Um, one of the things that I've seen in other contexts that has really supported this is understanding that the work I do is respected. The work I do can generate revenue for me. That's not the key reason that creatives do this. But you see, it's also something that helps you to know that as I invest and I pour myself into this, I'm operating and I'm pushing out messages in a context that my own identity is being respected. People know me for who I am. Um, in copyright, we often say that um, the work of a creative is an extension of him or herself. So they don't see any distinction between the things they put out and who they are. So when you distort somebody's message, you're actually distorting the very person's identity. And to that extent, creativity flourishes in places where, you know, respect is accorded to the works of creatives, the government respects, society respects, and people can understand clearly the messages that are coming. I wouldn't take Mr. Dickey's work, for example, and say, because I don't agree with an element of something he said, I'll push it out, tweak what I want to tweak, and say, this is my work. I rub on his creativity. He gets upset and probably decides not to write again. And we lose an opportunity. But when we understand what Mr. Dickey says, we may not, under, we may not appreciate or we may not agree with his view, but then I, I understand it. And then I put out my own view. But coming from a point of respect, and what happens is that, as he has rightly said today, culture continues to be reconstructed. And it continues to evolve a conversation that again transforms a culture. And so I think that the first thing I was trying to point out is that we need to increase in our society to be able to respect art as a, 
not just the livelihood, but is as the expression, the extension of the identities of these people who really spend time and think through issues to put forward uh, messages through their art. And I think, of course, the second aspect of um, where we need to see our work going is that I think that societies or art is actually a reflection of the society itself. Um, so Nollywood has been a key driver of Nigeria's identity. When I lived in South Africa, I was very shocked that everywhere I would go to, whether I was having meals at a, at a, in a restaurant, for example, the TV that would really attract the greatest crowd is the Nollywood screens. <laughs> And for many reasons, uh, the, 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 the people outside the country, so foreigners, were coming to an understanding and appreciation of Nigeria's culture just by watching these movies. And, and I think when we, when we ask ourselves, how, do, how does this you know, visual representation of who we are, how the world sees us as a country, not so much as you know individual pockets, but as a country, how, what messages are we putting out? I think the the point is to say that the more creators realize that our our messaging is not just to ourselves as a country, but it's also a messaging to our world, to the world. You know, telling a story of who we are as a people. I think it also helps us to push out or to see the responsibility in the work that we do. Um, you know, as uh, you know, as, as pushing out this message of our of our identity. So, just in a, in, a, in a nutshell, I think Nigeria needs to do a bit more in strengthening the rights of creatives to help them to find um, to put more into pushing out their messages freely. And I think on a second part, creatives should also be able to see consciously that what they do is not just a message for us as Nigerians, but it's also a message that helps us even in the international sphere, in terms of telling our stories as a people. Thank you very much. So you are tilting us towards the direction of collaboration and push for these forms of art that we, as a nation, as a people, we have to know that there is power in this thing. Can we strengthen this thing and start to push this thing called art as a tool for um, changing perceptions, um, re-narrating re, re stories and empathizing with people. That is the direction, right? All right, so an experience really changed my life at some point. So I was um, invited to uh, perform somewhere. It was with the um, UNDP. There was a program they had for Nigerian youth. And I, 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 I performed the poem. The, 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 a line, a particular line from it. Uh, which will lead me to the story is um, for the wisdom of elders look not to Twitter. It is written in time, not online. And for their knowledge, read between the lines of their wrinkles. Let me tell you a story. It is written with the blood of my forefathers, woven around the tongue of their mother, and it has never been told in a foreign tongue. It is a tale of invention, bravery, and conquest that rival the exploits of the gods. They say we come from the land where rivers sing a song. To the sound of horns, gongs, the beat of talking drums, and the happy feet of a resilient people. I was told we are descendants of the mortals, and mortals stronger than the mortals. I was told by moonlight, tales of fatherland in the eloquence of mother tongue. Once upon a time, we were kings from the womb of queens. From our outstanding humans, deities were made. Before ink met paper somewhere in the West, we cast words in iron, on parchment and straw, tablets of stone, and the heart of those in search of greatness. We crafted masterpieces with gold traded far and wide, designed legal tenders, made medicines from herbs and roots, as our lingual invention was a thing of wonder. I was talking about Nigeria. So after the old performer is a long poem, then after the event, two young men came to me. So one said, ah, I'm the DJ for this. I said, oh, okay, you are, nice work. Another person said, I'm a club hype man. I said, what's hype man? He said, in club, the people that are hype. Oh, I said, okay, wow, I like your career. So he said, <laughs> he said okay. I mean, he explained the hype man. I never knew what hype man was all about. 
So, so the first guy, the DJ said, Ross, you changed something. He said, see, as you see me, so I want jack back from this country. Anyway, I just see, but as I hear that your poem, I, I just did proud. I said, okay. He said, no. I said, bros, I, I don't proud now as I hear you. I, so I started laughing. The hype man just started hyping him. He said, yeah, I don't, you don't, they proud. You don't. I said, okay, this is what I men do. Anyway, so that was an experience. And why is it an experience for me? One single poem in one gathering changed the perspective of and perception of two people, young stars, who were on their path, maybe Jack Mine to Liberia or Congo Brazzaville. They don't, you know, they're still be sending Gary to you over there. So, and they said, see, bros, I don't proud now. And I said, wow, I may have to do more about this point. So I decided, I started thinking of maybe putting in, in, in video format that I can send it across board on social media rather than just having to stand on a stage to do that. Now, the, my main question is, what do we need to do more? as creatives, as writers, as journalists. Abu Karim, this burden is on you. As journalists, as culture critics, as creatives, what do we need to do more in collaboration, in pushing the frontiers? Are we doing enough? What do you think we need to do to start to push C4, C art as a tool for social change, for fostering unity and diversity? Then what do we need to do next? I think I'm a bit impatient with all these calls. Oh, it's a burden, you know, it's yeah. a responsibility. Yeah. I think it's a lot of BS and a lot of the reality gets lost in the BS. Um, the truth is, I'll still go back to what I said. Yeah. It's it's about understanding. When you're talking about empathy or something you said earlier, it still comes, you, you cannot do all those things you don't understand. Absolutely. Now, we can still talk about literature. You write a story. You understood Abu Bakr's story. Yeah. And then it helped you to empathize, to, you know, to further understand an entire region. Just a few books, you know, very possible, very, very doable. Um, take music, for instance. I mean, in my own experience, I told you a lot of um, other cultures I experienced through music because I understood what the songs were trying to say. Sometimes even the most, um, how do I put it now? Even the kind of art that, that you know, the artist tends to navel gaze a lot. You look at it very well. There's still some stuff there to understand. Maybe the motivation, maybe there's a message that needs to be understood. So when you understand it, you know, that, that burden you're putting on Abdul Karim, you know, on shoulders or DKs, you know, will be less. And then people will enjoy it more and understand more when you you don't look at it as um, a very dire thing like that. Because it's all part of um, humanity. Art is an expression of humanity. People practice it to be understood. You go to a gallery, there's an exhibition, and you talk to you know the painter, and he explains on abstraction, and in your mind you're thinking this guy just splashed paint you know, on the canvas. But the truth is, the guy just painted his heart out or his soul or whatever he's saying, you know, and then that's what it is. Maybe you're not open to understanding. So maybe the call should be for, you know, more efforts at understanding art or artists or what an artist's art is trying to do, you know. And as a journalist, um... I actually don't see journalism as an art, but that's a controversial subject I don't want to go into. It, it's it's quite technical, yeah? Um, I, it's kind of like architecture. You build something, you know, it has a purpose, it has an, an end point, you know, there's a, it has a use. So you build it together. So um, I, I don't see it as, as art, art like that. Of course, there are aspects of it. You promote, you promote art. Uh, but maybe not, but um, yeah. So now, but what journalism does is it, it sort of it promotes a, a mindset, an idea. You know, it helps people to understand complex situations can be simplified. You know, difficult truths can be expressed in a more accessible way. 
you know, I'm not saying Molly cuddles something. No, 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 no. I, I actually, I'm a very big fan of ripping the band-aid off. Say the truth as it is. So I don't know. There are all these aspects of the question you asked that um, I found a little problematic. Not that the question is problematic, but problematic for me in the sense that it, it messes with my train of thought, you know, so many plates spinning around. But the short of it is that, um, yeah, art and artists have a lot to actually contribute when it comes to, you know, people understanding each other. Because truly that's what art is all about. It's about understanding art. And then art itself is an expression of humanity. So do the necessary calculation downwards and you have it. All right. Thank you very much. Now, a lot of this has to do with policy. Policy can really help a nation to achieve all these things. Um, and basically, let me give you an instance. I, I attended a government secondary school. And all through my six years in the secondary school, plus a few more of strike, um, teachers going on strike, I never did history. There was no history teacher anywhere. I was so in love with history, there was nobody to teach, nobody to guide. So um, I was lucky to have a father who is a hoarder in terms of books and some journals from archiver things. At some point, it's still holding things from 1960s. Okay, maybe they'll fall into antiquities later. Now, I started delving into his library. Okay, what is this? That was how I became a um, history enthusiast. I started learning about different things. Nobody, all through my six years in secondary school, I never saw any history teacher. And at some point, I don't know how true this is, I heard history was taken out of the curriculum. Then, Right? Then I, later I heard it was brought back. Now, what country takes history out of its curriculum when you are trying to mold the minds of young ones? It does, it's the road to, to perdition. So what do you think needs to be done from in, the, in the direction of policies and uh, provisions from, let me say, the government now? We can't uh, eliminate government completely from this narrative. DK, what do you think? can be done? Um, I usually don't like questions like this. <laughs> what government should do? Um, because government is very problematic. And since I'm not in government, I am not in <laughs> government. I don't know who I'm talking to. <laughs> but I think that when it comes to creating identity, you know, building bridges, it's important to be very deliberate and intentional about it and to start early telling children the sorts of stories that will help them understand children from other places and on the foundation of understanding, then you get respect and you get empathy. Um, you know, I read when I was a young man, I read about a conversation between Namdi Azikiwe and the Sadauna. And uh, I don't know what they were arguing about, but Zeke said, you know, let's forget our differences. And the Sadauna responded and said, for those who don't know who the Sadauna is, that's uh, Madubelu. Because sometimes we assume that people know. Uh, so Madubelu responded and said, no, let us understand our differences. And as I've grown older, I recognize that they were talking about the same thing. And one person was looking at the destination and the other person was telling you the path there too. Now to get to a place where we're able to rise above our differences, we have to understand them. And that's the path we walk. And I think that we have to very actively, deliberately, consciously cultivate greater understanding of other ethnic groups and other religions and other in Nigeria from a young age. You know, and that is something that can be done with our curriculum. If you have people that know what they are doing to, to start, as if I'm growing up in Lagos, to start learning about Borono from when I'm, so that Borono is not a strange, other people out there kind of thing to me. It's part of my country. I know the culture. We were even luckier with the socials. I don't know what they used to call it then. 
you know, when you learn about, oh, there was a fishing festival in Agungu. There's, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if it was social studies or something. That just gives you an idea. But we have to go beyond that idea. We have more detailed references of things happening in America, in the UK, than what is happening in, in Borno State. And that is why somebody will grow up and call his son, feel very, an Igbo guy will feel very comfortable.
Hang that bag like a tooth bag. On your shoulder. Like you said, if you want to change the mindset of society, it's not done uh, just by living together. It's conscious, intentional. You have to redesign the curriculum to put this practically into the into the kids in school and all the way up. You have to really manipulate positively the thinking of your people. You can't just allow them to be floating. If you don't do those conscious manipulation by way of policy, doing things that when you, when you do for five years, you start getting results and you know that changes have started happening. That is how countries develop and change their mindset. But in Nigeria, we just float from one government to the other. We float. We don't follow any path and we want to get there. We can never get there unless we follow a path and stick to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Okay. I'm seeing Ronaldo. Okay. Ronaldo, you're back. Okay, um, Bashti, Ronaldo, I'll come to you, sir. I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Then we'll wrap it up. Oh, okay. So, 60 seconds, please. Uh, instead of asking a question, I would like to answer one of your questions. And uh, at the same time, I would like to with answering your questions. Just to find why you are here. Why are you here? Together with us in the embassy. Of the have, you, have you inflicted that question to your mind? Why are you not here to talk to you? Why are you here? So it, I think it's related to, to the fact that when we are one with the other, we are not one. We only become one through hustling. I, I'd like to, to bring a, a metaphor here in a very serious manner, but uh, it's about sexuality. Uh, when Freud talk, talks about it, uh, he says that uh, uh, sex is much more than sex. And uh, for us to reach an orgasm, we need to go through uh, a game. You go hustling. Yeah? So at some point, we reach what we call orgasm, or not. And I believe that the artists, using that metaphor, are the, the people who are courageous enough to, to go and do the hustle and cause the conflict. Because people like me, I'm a diplomat. I have padlocked in my mouth. I can't say much. I'm very glad, in a way, not to be in the panel. <laughs> I can't say much. I have to filter three times before I say a word. But the artists are, are the ones who don't have padlock in their mouth. And, but they are the ones who are so sensitive that they can go cause the conflict, but to a certain extent that the pleasure is not lost. So at some point, we reach this orgasm together. So that is the moment when we come one with the other. And uh, in a second part I would like to mention is that uh, we need to... to, to, to enter in an adventure of getting to know each other. Nigerians know each other, but Nigerians know other cultures as well. So let me tell you something. Since I arrived here, every time people talk to me, they, and they, and they, they, they try to speak my language. They speak Spanish. So every time I go, say, oh, okay, 
That's fine. So let's go. It's an opportunity for me to, to tell you that in Brazil we speak Portuguese. Uh, a second thing. Ah, uh, are you Brazilian? Let's dance salsa. Okay. Another opportunity. Yeah. Okay. In Brazil, we don't, we don't dance salsa. We dance samba. So uh, through hustling and a, bit, a little bit of conflict and through adventures is when we... We, we play this game of history. We come to terms with history. We give the chance of history changing and we, we create new history. So that is when we can invent ourselves once again. When I was watching you here, I, I was late, I'm sorry. I was supposed to introduce you here. But I, went to, I needed to go home and collect my two, my, my two boys. So I entered and I said, please, that, that is working. They call me. That is working. Leave me in peace. Ah, okay. But as soon as I sat down and started concentrating the conversation, they start blah, 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 in this and that and this. And, and no, we boys, we are very careful in being violent with our kids. <laughs> né? So we. Are <laughs> so I, then I was thinking, am I one with my two kids? My my two kids. We are. We are one with another. But uh, we, it's not about love all the time. It's not about love all the time. And I think the artists are the ones who, who deal with the conflict the best. So thank you very much. I would like to- Wow, say this. thank you so much, Ronaldo, for that insight. Thank you very, very much. So 60 seconds, the gentleman there, straight 12 o'clock. Yeah, you. Bash, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Your left. Yes, thank you. 60 seconds, please. We have five minutes to go. All right. Um... I am Mustafa. Uh, I just feel that because art is an expression of experience, uh, first and foremost, the artists have to widen the experience they have and to express it more deeply in order to bring people into that world of experience they're expressing. Because as someone said earlier, most of the art we experience is fleeting. That which remains with us is always the most deeply experienced by the artists themselves. However it is, whether it's transgressive, whether it is collaborative, however it is, it is deeply experienced. So the artists themselves have to experience more to express better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very brilliant. The lady in white, yes. So 60 seconds, that will be our last, then we'll wrap it up, please. We, ah, Thank you. Um, I think something that we really, um, that I think will be sustainable is for the love of country and culture to move or include the heart, to move from the head to the heart. We spoke about education, which is very important, and that's for the head. But artists need to do it for us, for the heart, because... For history, we can learn from school and all of that, but we really need to move beyond, you know, the intellectual part. And I noticed that one of the panelists was a bit, um, I wouldn't say avoiding you, Abdukarim, the word empathy and going with understanding. That's for the head, but we need empathy for the heart. We need understanding to lead us to empathy. I am from Plateau State, and then I'm. I started when I started to mingle with. Um, Wazobians, that's how I call them. That's people either Hausa, no, not Hausa, but Yoruba and Igbo a lot. I would say um, my name and then they'll get curious. Oh, do you know the arguments we go through for me to convince them that I'm not Hausa? I don't even understand it. And this is not an intellectual problem. This is just, there's just something about us that locks up. Because then I, I use it as an opportunity, as Ronaldo said, to then say, okay, how many ethnic groups are in Nigeria? And it, nobody answers me three. But they have to look at me as only one of that three. They are reluctant to learn. They are reluctant to open up themselves to receive a new thing because there's deficiency. Do you understand? So that's the part where we need our hearts to open to be able to learn and understand each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry. We won't be able to take more comments because we have only three minutes to go. So, so sorry. But we can continue the conversation after this. Believe me, outside, we, we have the whole evening to 
to talk, to banter on this. Now, to wrap it up, we are mostly Nigerians here. Many of us are artists, creatives, we create. And this, this session, I think, should start something within us. We start to create in the direction of using our... What? Oh, okay. I thought I was loud. All right. To so start to create in the direction of using our talents, our gifts, to change the narrative within society, to impose that positive change, to break down these walls of division in Nigeria. And I'm sure maybe not our generation, maybe the next generation would achieve that unity in diversity we've been clamoring for. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your contribution. And to the fantastic panelists, starting from um, Abdul Karim, thank you so much for the insight. Thank you for your opinions. Oluato Biloba, thank you very, very much. DK Chukumerije, my brother from Northern Mother, thank you so much. So we'll continue the conversation outside.